CataractCoach.com, extended depth of focus lens implants for cataract surgeries. What are our options today? Now, we have multiple options now for extended depth of focus lenses, EDOF lenses. And those today primarily are ones that shift some of the incoming light or alter that wavefront. They're ones that have diffractive rings that give us that wider range. And now we even have a small aperture IOL that gives us a pinhole effect, again, for a narrower pupil size effectively, and therefore a larger depth of focus. So they all tend to work in different manners, but give us a similar result when each one has its own pluses and minuses. There's still no way of cheating physics. So let's talk about a couple of simple topics first. First, let's talk about what's depth of field, what's depth of focus. We can see in this picture here, depth of field is actually out in the field, whereas depth of focus is in the eye. Now, we often use those words interchangeably, but in fact, they are different. But it's okay. For the purpose of our discussion, let's just stick with extended depth of focus lenses. Now, what does it mean we change the depth of focus? Well, if you ever used a proper camera, you know the aperture size plays a big role in determining the depth of focus or depth of field in camera terms. Look at this picture here. So here we can see that this alarm clock timer is in the front and it's in focus, but with a narrow depth of field, the bricks behind it are not in focus. But on the other side, when you have a wide depth of field, both the alarm clock here in front, the timer, as well as those bricks behind it, they're in focus. You can even start to see the, tr the leaves of the plant behind that. So it's a very wide range there. Now that has a lot to do in camera terms with aperture size, or for us in the eye, pupil size. And so why isn't this such a big concern for young people? Well, young people have the best possible camera. If you look at a young person's eye, First, the pupil size is dynamic. It doesn't stay the same, it's not fixed. It's very large in a dark environment, and it gets very small in a very bright environment, like bright sunlight. It also pu will change, the pupil size will change, in response to near stimulus. So when a young person looks at something up close, of course, one of the things you'll notice is the pupil gets a little smaller. So again, a dynamic pupil is one very important thing in a young person. And the dynamic nature of that pupil tends to be affected with age. Everything gets worse with age, hate to tell you. But certainly pupil size, the dynamic ability to change the pupil, and the range from how small to how large changes well. If you look at age-related studies and look at the population, average pupil size in the same, let's say, dimly lit environment tends to decrease with age. So as you get older, you tend to have a smaller pupil. Now, the other thing that's even more important is that young people have a tremendous amount of accommodation. That dynamic accommodation is when they can focus the lens of their eye, their human crystalline lens, the thing that becomes the cataract, that can be focused for many diopters of accommodation. You can look at a young child who can see perfectly 20-20 for distance, and at the same time, this 10-year-old child can hold a piece of paper right up to his or her nose and still read the text. That's a tremendous range. And as you know, we have built, our ability to focus that lens decri declines with age, decreases. So you know that, okay, 10 years old, you can read it here. Maybe 20 is here. Here's 30. Here's 40. Here's 50. And all of a sudden, your arms aren't long enough. So when we go to replace that with a man-made lens for cataract surgery, what do we have? Well, we still don't have available in the USA a proper dynamic accommodating lens. That's what we're working on. You've seen the videos here we post on Cataract Coach from LensGen and the Juveen lens. And I was honored to be the first surgeon ever on the planet to implant that in 2015. And now that lens is starting FDA trials. So we've got high hopes for having a true accommodative lens at some point in the future. But let's talk today about what we do have, which is extended depth of focus lenses. And here are three options that we have here. Now, we already talked about how pupil size is important. Let's look at an example here of what is the focus range we can expect from an EDOF lens, extended depth of focus lens. So you can see here in the picture, Plano is our word for zero, so zero prescription, that's focused at far distance. 
Minus 150 is myopia. That's focused at somewhere in the intermediate range. Minus 150 correlates to about 67 centimeters, or in English, you know, it's about 26 inches. And then you can see here, someone who has mixed astigmatism, you see these patients who have a refraction of plano minus 150 at a certain axis. And they pretty much go without glasses, but there's a compromise. And the compromise is they actually have two focal points in the eye, depending on what meridian you're looking at. So at one focal point, they're focused at plano or emetropy or zero for far distance, and the other one at minus 150 for that intermediate range. And so the image quality is not great because of that, because it's uncorrected astigmatism, but there's an upside that it gives a wider range. And then finally, what's the ideal extended depth of focus lens? The ideal one gives you, like this picture shows you, a really great range with no side effects. But that doesn't exist. And so let's talk about what does exist. We have the Bausch & Lomb Aphthera IC8. Now this IC8, this was originally developed by a company called AccuFocus, who planned on putting these little rings, these little donut shaped materials, inside the corneas of patients. So you do a, like a LASIK flap, put the ring down, put the flap down, let it heal up, and it gave a wider range. It used that pinhole effect. It was meant to be in the non-dominant eye of a patient, let's say, who is 50 years old and presbyopic and wanting to have better near range. So that worked pretty well, but there were some issues. Some patients' corneas didn't tolerate this. As we know, the corneas don't like to be messed with. And so the company had a brilliant idea. Hey, why not put this into an intraocular lens, an IOL? Because that'll be sequestered from the eye. It'll be safe. The cornea will be happy because you're not touching the cornea. And there you were born with the IC8 lens. And here's the lens. Now, if we look at it here, the lens has an overall six millimeter optic. It has the outside of the donut being 3.23 millimeters. And then the inside of the donut, the affected pupil is 1.36 millimeters. Yeah, that's a small pupil, a 1.36 millimeter pupil. Now the company is recommending that you put this lens in the non-dominant eye of a patient who gets a monofocal lens in the dominant eye, which is aimed for best distance vision, or we call plano or emetropia or prescription zero. And while the lens getting the aphthera should be aimed, the eye getting the aphthera should be aimed at minus 0 0.75. So they are advocating a form of like mini monovision, zero in the dominant eye and the aphthera IC8 eye minus 0 0.75. And that's gonna give the most appropriate range here. Now it does beg the question, how much light is lost? So this lens works by creating a pinhole effect. If you wear glasses now, take off your glasses, look across the room and make a little pinhole and look through it. And by golly, it actually improves the vision. So by allowing just these central light rays through that don't need as much focusing, the depth of focus increases, but you're blocking light. You're losing light, that's for sure. How much light? Well. Let's go back to junior high and do some simple geometry. So here you go. So if you look at this picture here, we've got the six millimeter optic, light hits that. It's blocked by the ring. And then the center part is letting it, the light through. So if you do the math for it here, you can see it's pi times the radius squared of the optic minus pi times the radius squared of the outer dimension of the ring plus adding back in the light that comes from the very center aperture, which is pi times the radius of that central opening squared. And so we do the math here, and what do we come up with? Well, I did it for you. So you can see at a very large six millimeter pupil, the patients are allowed to get light from around the donut plus through the center of the donut. So the total amount of light that's allowed to go in the eye is about 76%. And about a quarter of it, let's say 24% of the light is blocked or lost. That's pretty good. You really don't notice that as much. But if you get down to smaller pupil sizes, you can see in a four millimeter pupil, you lost more than half the light. And if you get to a three millimeter pupil, you only get 21% of the light. So a monofocal lens with a simple optic and a three millimeter pupil will let in 100% of light. But the aphthera lens with just that tiny 1.36 millimeter pupil in that same eye with a three millimeter pupil will let in 21% of the light. So there is some give and take here. 
You can't cheat physics. I think this lens is great for unusual or aberrated corneas. Patients who've had, let's say, a lot of irregular radial keratotomy or maybe have some ectasia in the cornea, and this can actually help give a better quality image. But I'd be cautious, and you'd want to be very careful about putting it in patients in both eyes. Because think about this. If you have patients who have a little bit smaller pupil and you have it in both eyes and now you have them in a dim or dark environment, it may be very tough to function at night. If you are this tough case scenario of a three millimeter pupil in, let's say, in dim lighting, and you have this lens in both eyes, then you're only getting 21% of the ambient light. So this is the thing where you have to really take pupil size into consideration and really follow the manufacturer's directions of using it only in the non-dominant eye. Now, there could be exceptions for why you'd want to put in someone bilaterally, but we'll get into that later. Let's talk about the next lens that we have here. The next is the j and Technus Symphony. So the Technus lens, the Symphony line, uses diffractive rings here to help give that extended depth of focus. And it certainly works. But what's the side effect here? Yeah, you get the extended range, but this lens, among all the lenses I've used, and I'm sure you'll agree, has probably the most nighttime dysphotopsias. Glare, halo, people have reported to me spider web effects on the vision. So that ends up being a big challenge to deal with for a lot of patients. And again, the downside there is this lens is maybe going to be a little bit less affected by pupil size, but you're going to have more of the nighttime glare, halo, spider webbing, etc. Now we got the Alcon Vividi, also a good lens, but has some compromises. This has a central focusing element in the central two to two and a half millimeters, somewhere in there, 2.2 millimeters. That thing ends up giving you increased curvature to give you a little more power there. It kind of wave front shapes the incoming light. As a result, you do get a wider range, but there's a compromise. First, you lose contrast. You lose, let's say, about a third of the contrast. In patients where we put the vividity in one eye and a nice monofocal lens in the other eye, they almost certainly will say, I can definitely tell the difference in the quality of the image, especially at night. The colors are much more vivid. The clarity of the vision is a lot better in the monofocal lens, and it's a little compromised in the vividity lens. And that makes sense. That's the physics of it. In fact, even the package insert from the company says you must warn patients about issues with nighttime vision with this lens. So maybe no glare and halos, but the contrast is decreased quite a bit. Another thing to take into account is pupil size of this lens woo, makes a big difference, especially in your refractive planning. Think about this. If your patient now has that small three millimeter pupil and more than two millimeters of that is taken up by just that central focusing element, you may aim for a perfect outcome of zero or amotropy or plano, and they may end up myopic, minus 75, minus one, maybe even more. And we've seen this. And so in those patients, you want to take into account and change the way you do your lens calculations. In a patient with a larger four or five millimeter pupil, yeah, you can pretty much aim for emetropia and get emetropia. So when you look at it now, you've got three different choices available of lenses in the U.S. Now, there may be other manufacturers that have other lenses that have something in this regard. They're monofocal plus lenses, as you know. People say the eye hands from J&J &J may be a little bit better than a monofocal, monofocal plus. Maybe the Clarion's in that same category from Alcon. But again, those are still monofocal lenses. So the main three extended focus lenses we have in the U.S. are the BNL Aptera, which is the small aperture. And again, downside there is loss of light. Also, you're dialing in a mini monovision. And you want to put it in just the one eye as per manufacturer's instructions. Number two, the other lens we got here, we got the Jane j Symphony. Again, a very good lens, less dependent on pupil size. However, diffractive rings causing the most nighttime dysphotopsias, glare, halo, spider webbing, etc. The Alcon Vividi, nice lens too, but again, compromises, which is because it's that central focusing element, that's gonna cause you to have, yeah, more depth of focus, but a loss of contrast, especially at night vision. So it's going to be a little bit compromised. Now, no glare and halos for my patients, 
But the thing you have to take into account is pupil size, because now this is really pupil dependent. Smaller pupils are going to get a lot more of that central focusing element, whereas the larger pupils are going to have less effect from it. So all these things go into account in determining what's the best lens for your patient. And as you can see now, there is no perfect answer. There is no perfect lens other than the one you had when you were 25 years old. And those days are long gone. Thanks for watching.